Good afternoon. Um, my name is Michael Davis for, and I'm from Gorkana. And thank you very much for all coming along to a Gorkana briefing with a twist. Now, the twist is that after our chat, we are the, the, about 20 teams of uh, Bloomberg News are going to be joining us outside. So we hope very much that you'll be able to stay behind and get to meet many of the faces uh, behind Bloomberg News. Um, but beforehand, and I dare, almost dare not say this, as a warm-up act, we have quite a top-rate panel. On my immediate left is Mark Gilbert, uh, who has, for nearly five years, Mark, you've been the, uh, the London bureau chief of Bloomberg News, but he's been at Bloomberg over 20 years now, is that right? 23 on July the 1st. July the 1st. I'm unemployable. <laughs> Etched in your memory there. Uh, Next to Mark is Anna Edwards, the co-anchor of the Countdown show that runs UK time 6 to 8. Yes. So you're kicking off for the, the, the opening of the markets here, but also all your RNS statements are landing on her desk at 7 o'clock in the morning. Yes. Um, just if you are moaning about those RNS statements, uh, the, the unearthly t hour that you have to get up to, to send those out. Anna, what time did your alarm clock go off this morning? <laughs> Uh, 2 a.m. So don't complain, please. Um, <laughs> and on I'm not my usually still, you know, functioning at this time, so I apologise. <laughs> we are very, very sorry. Anyway, um, we're very glad you're here. And on my far left is Stryker McGuire. Now, Stryker is a senior editor with Bloomberg Markets. But, uh, Stryker, we could perhaps blame you for, the, for coining the phrase Cool Britannia. You could... You could, uh, but it wouldn't be entirely accurate. We never actually used that phrase. We, the cover was London Rules, but then the unbelievable John Major and Tony Blair turned it into Cool Britannia. They both referenced it as Cool Britannia. I'll put this in context. Stryker, for, for over, uh, over 30 years, was a senior journalist with Newsweek and latterly was the London Bureau Chief of Newsweek where he was the US and indeed the world's chronicler of, of the uh, New Labour years. Uh, but Stryker, you, you, uh, you've been with Bloomberg a couple of years now? Three years, yes. Three years, and he's a senior editor with Bloomberg Markets and is going to talk to us about a whole, the whole panoply of, uh, of Bloomberg's print products. But um, it's quite a sizzle there, isn't it? I get a little bit uh, overawed by some of those the, those numbers and those figures, but I guess, like many people, my perception of Bloomberg is this huge media organisation at the heart of the global capital markets, and at the heart of Bloomberg's um, of Bloomberg's business model is news. Mark, can you explain the, the very particular and unique role that news plays within this organisation? Well, as a media group, we're incredibly fortunate. We have this product called the Bloomberg Terminal. Um, which is the, the sun around which the rest of the company rotates. It costs $20,000 a year to rent, and we have 320,000 paying customers, which makes us an $8 billion a year company. So at a time when the rest of the media world is facing challenges, we have a very fortunate position in that our proprietor, Michael Bloomberg, is very much in favor of expanding our media operations. It means we can be in more than 130 bureaus around the world. We have more than 2,300 journalists. Anywhere where news is breaking, we want to be there. Uh, and our ambition is to be the most trusted name in news, not just for business and finance, but for all kinds of news that you might want to go to. Um, what is it that you, you think is absolutely crucial for our audience here today of, of professional communicators to understand about Bloomberg? News has changed in the past four or five years um, and a lot of news has become commodity news. There's a lot of places you can go to on the web where news aggregation sites are doing a lot of the bread and butter work. So what Bloomberg is all about is moving the needle. It's being influential. We still need to have every single individual discrete news item that is available because our customers demand that of them, of us. And trust me, if you charge someone $20,000 a year for a product, you hear from them quite often, quite frequently, and, and quite vociferously. The next stage in the DNA evolution of Bloomberg, the Darwinistic path that we need to be on, is to be more and more influential, to change people's behavior, not just about what they buy, sell, or hedge in the markets. We're pretty good at that not just in being first with the news, we're pretty good at that as well. 
we need to be better at being the first port of call for anyone who wants to know what's going on minute by minute and influencing decision makers. And that's increasingly what we're able to do. So the first Barama speech after his election, Bloomberg Television. When Cameron wanted to talk about Europe a year ago, he did it in this auditorium. The new Prime Minister of Ukraine wanted to talk to the markets today on his first day in office. He did it through Bloomberg Television. We want to be that avenue whereby world leaders and decision makers and newsmakers talk to the world. But everybody's course acting image of a, of a, of a investment bank's trading floor is dominated by Bloomberg screens and it is the terminal that's at the heart of the business. But as we saw on the sizzle, you know, you operate online, on TV, in print, and there's the terminal. How do you distinguish between those different platforms and how should the, uh, how should the PR community here view the Bloomberg across those platforms? We want to deliver news in any format that readers want to get it in. Um, we have a psychological <coughs> aversion to giving things away for free but we recognize that that's partly how you become more influential. So we build in things like time delays and there's some things we just don't give away for free. But in terms of multi-platform, lots of companies claim to be multi-platform. The difference is we want to be cross-platform. So you want to be able to reposition all that different news for different audiences. I'll give you a great example. About three weeks ago, we launched something called the London Brief, which is a digital newsletter. It goes out at 5 p.m. every day. It's four pages. It leads mostly with Bloomberg exclusive. You won't have read it in any of the press that morning. You won't read it in the press the next day. It's most exclusive content and it's free. And we're doing this because within London, we want to be the most influential voice. So we want anyone who's going to a business function at night or is on the train home to be able to read this and they'll be the smartest person in the room wherever they go to next. Um, but you've got all these different platforms, and it's slightly daunting from a, a PR's perspective. Is if you know if they want to hit Bloomberg across a couple of those platforms, should they th make multiple approaches to you, or is there? Is you, do you, would you advocate a single point of entry? For the companies that a PR firm is covering, have a relationship with our beat reporters. That's going to be your first port of call always, and then the beat reporters themselves. They want their stories on as many platforms as possible, so they are going to be your best advocates. If you want to be in Business Week, which has a million paying subscribers, the Beat Reporters, if you're delivering them something from your clients that is a surprise, that has an interesting news story, that has a fresh angle on the world, the Beat Reporters are going to be your best advocates within the newsroom for making that happen. Television is slightly different, and I'll leave that to Anne, but across our multiple platforms, we like recycling our news in those different ways. Again, because we want to be more influential, we kind of, because we want to reach as many eyeballs and minds as we can, the beat reporters are going to be your key points of contact within the newsroom, and they will be the advocates for the news that you want to put out into the world. Uh, let's have a little bit more of a look about uh, the operations here in London. How, how many journalists sit in this, in this office here? About 280, and in the office as a whole, we have about 3,000 employees. And of those 280, how, how, are they, how are they split up across the various platforms? We think of the world in terms of beats for right. the most part. And so we have a small team dedicated to projects and investigations. We have some people who work for Bloomberg Markets. We have some people who work on sports. And then we kind of divide the world of business and finance into beats. So we have company news, which subdivides into retail or transport or commodities companies. We then have markets, so government bonds and FX. We have corporate finance. We have an economy team. We have a team that covers the Middle East and all the emerging markets from here. So we tend to think of the world in terms of asset classes, for want of a better word, partly because that's how our customers think about it, our paying customers, but mostly because that's how you develop expertise for reporters. We want our reporters to be best in class on every market that they cover, on every area of companies that they cover, and on every asset class that we're going to care about. So that's how we think about the world. And is there such a thing as a typical day at Bloomberg News? Do all those teams operate sort of as their, as own, their own entities, or is there, a, is there a sort of editorial guideline for, for across the newsroom? There's no typical day apart from sheer naked terror most of the time um, because the real-time news business um, is frenetic, no question about it. One, one thing about the 7am RNS rush, don't do it. 
give us it under embargo. <laughs> we'll do a much better job for you and your life will be much calmer and we will respect the embargo, I promise you. Um, but the typical day in the newsroom, we have a 7.30 global conference call where there's an Asia handover and we work out, okay, what still needs pursuing? And then all the team leaders within Europe discuss what the big issues are that we're planning to cover that day. We have another call at 12.30, which then does sort of a US New York handover. We have a 3 p.m. call, which is a little bit bigger picture call that says, okay, we sort of know what happened today. How are we going to move the needle on these stories? What are we going to tell the world they didn't know? How are we going to put this news into context? How are we going to influence the people who are reading this news? Um, but we're in constant communication. We are basically a communications company in many ways. And so I probably receive 650 emails a day, of which 600 I have to do something about. And that's how we communicate. Um, but we're very much, in terms of looking at news, we're global. We want to be able to draw in resources from Hong Kong or from Washington or wherever we can add to a story. So a great example is the Bitcoin story. It's a fully global story. And when you've got 130 full-size news bureaus around the world, you can draw from a lot of different places to make sure you're telling that story best you can. And a big departure for you about five years ago was you got into the views business. Um, and so layered on top of this news, you've got a dedicated team offering commentary as well. We've always done commentary. We hired our first columnist in about 1993, if I remember rightly, and I became a columnist for the first time in 1999. Um, I should confess that I'm about to change hats, and after five years of being bureau chief, I'm going to join Bloomberg View in April, actually. Um, but Bloomberg View was set up specifically under, under David Shipley, who we, we stole from the New York Times. He did editorials at the New York Times. Um, Bloomberg View is there so that the world isn't all dominated by what Fox News says about what's going on. Um, we have a very strong corporate ethos. Anyone who's heard Mike Bloomberg speak on a range of issues knows he is very passionate about gun control, women's rights, about the role of cities in the world. And so Bloomberg View is a platform for us to have an editorial voice, um, to say what we think should be happening in the world, and to try and change policy and move the needle in that way as well, with, with commentary, analysis, and opinion, very, very separated from what we do in the news business. Um, facts are sacred, commentary is free, very old saying. Um, but we keep a very sharp Chinese wall between the two. But we do want to have a voice out there. We do want to have an opinion out there. And we do have a corporate culture that has opinions on a lot of things in the world. Um, the, other, uh, the other point I was going to uh, draw out on the, on the, on the views side is that um, there's, there's, been an empty, uh, there's been an empty chair in New York for the past 12 years. And there's a, where and then someone's come back from sabbatical. Is that going to change the way in which uh, Bloomberg is going to approach its news business. Mike is passionate about so many things. Um, the first thing he, he, he's done is to, to, to sit at the terminal and use it and to start coming to news meetings and involving himself back in the business because he has been away for 12 years. Um, it's very early days to say how that's going to actually impact things. He's got a lot of other hats on at the moment as well. His Global Cities Initiative is, is, is very important for, for the ex-mayor. He's chairman of the Serpentine Gallery, which again he's passionate about. Um, but listen, it's his train set. <laughs> he's going to play with it. Yeah. But I've heard you talk in the past about the, the crucial thing for Bloomberg is, and is, is anything that, ch that impacts the price of, of capital. And um, if, you, if the capital markets price things incorrectly, like it did before the credit crunch. Do you think that actually asks a question of the way in which information is provided to the markets? I think the credit crunch showed beyond all doubt that markets are not efficient. And it has been an absolute bonanza for financial journalism to have such an incredible event in our lifetimes to write about. Uh, it killed me off. I was a bond journalist and I was kind of one of the people in the world who knew what debt and duration were and convexity and those interesting things in credit default swaps. And, and we were very small sets. Now every bloody person knows what a bond is and what debt is and what. So I'm, you know, my career's over in that way. I don't have a unique selling point anymore. But in terms of financial news, markets are not efficient. Um, if you look just at what we've had this year, currency rigging, who knew? Who knew that all these traders were rigging currency rates? Gold is next. People rigging gold, oil prices. This is all news we've broken. It will always be a fertile ground. And have you responded to that? 
Break more news. And write more stories. Q, set up a new team. Well, we did. We, we decided that, and apologies to our banking clients who may be in the audience, but we set up a new financial crimes unit because there's so much financial crime to write about that we decided we needed a special little team to, to cover it exclusively, and that's, that's going really well. There's lots to write <laughs> about. <laughs> Well, let's move on before we get too involved in any of the, anybody's businesses out there. But um, Anna, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and one of the other, Bloomberg has always had Bloomberg TVs, as, as far as I can remember, as a, a terminal sitting in the corner of the office. And um, not only that, actually, I think Mark Barton, who was your co-anchor, was on it the first it. time I saw it. <laughs> but, um, but at the same time, you've been a professional TV presenter for over 10 years now. How have you seen t uh, business TV changed in that, in, over that time? Well, one of the biggest things that's changed, actually, is not necessarily in TV itself, but in its relationships with other media. That has changed beyond all recognitions compared to where it was when I started. The relationship between TV and digital is it's, it's a fundamental part of, of, of most TV newsrooms, to be honest, but it's certainly a fundamental part of, of our TV newsroom now. And that, t 10 years ago, that would have not been foreseen at all. That's, that's really changing the way that people consume television news, and that in itself comes back to influence the types of stories that we tell and the types of audiences we reach. So I can see that really has sort of a double impact on you. Well, one is the fact that what was a very immediate form of media now has a hang time, but also you have that possibility to interact. How much is social media actually playing a role in real time on the show? Yeah, well, it, it does. I mean, my colleague Francine Lacroix, I'll definitely tip my hat to her. She's much better at multitasking on the conducting an interview and tweeting at the same time front. Um, I dabble in that, but I, I'm on Twitter, at Anna Edwards News, if anyone wants to find me. Um, but, you know, we, we, we use it very actively. As I, I, this is the first, one of the first things I do in the morning when I get into the office is to, to look at the websites and to look at any stories that just take my, take my fancy, anything that I'm particularly interested in, any headline that grabs my attention on Bloomberg.com, and I tweet out a few, a few headlines that have, that have grabbed me. And that's, that's, uh, that's definitely a new way of engaging with, with viewers. You don't always get the conversations you want. You, know, you don't always get polite conversations in return, but you know, that's, that's the way things have moved. You mentioned Francine there. Well, it's a, a good cue to uh, have a quick look at this video in which Francine features. We want to bring you some of the personalities, some of the people and the companies right at the heart of the European business story. By speaking to global newsmakers from the fields of finance, business and economics to bring you the interviews that matter. If it's big and it's happening in the markets and you need to know about it for your global business day, then you'll learn about it here. At the start of the trading day, why would you watch anything else? We have all angles covered from foreign exchange to commodities to, of course, stocks. It's probably the most critical hour and one that you don't want to get wrong. The Pulse goes beyond the headlines. This is the show that actually thinks about what's happening. This is the show that takes those headlines and turns it into something more meaningful. We speak to a lot of chief executives, but we try and make it personal. It's about having smart conversations that the viewer can go away with having a better understanding of the world. Anna, you're uh, the anchor of Countdown. Uh, that, as I mentioned, is the show that runs for two hours before the markets open. The absolute crucial part of the day, all, everyone, all the traders are in the city are at their desks uh, getting ready for, for the trading. What are you trying to achieve during those two hours? It's supposed to be a show that sets you up for the day ahead. So, we, as we were saying there in that, uh, in that video, if there's something big going on in the day ahead that you need to know about, if you're connected with the markets, then that should be a feature of Countdown. Um, but more than that, it's a, it's a show that wants to go, just like, well, like our other shows do, to some extent, it wants to go beyond the numbers. It wants to not just be a, a sort of talking RNS statement, because frankly, that would send most, most people to sleep. So we try and add some personality to all our conversations. We try and have intelligent conversations with anybody who's making news on that particular day, whether that's with chief executives, whether that's a sort of more thematic conversation about something that we're interested in as a newsroom. So, um, but it, yeah, it is a, a looking ahead show. It's a setting yourself up for the day ahead show. 
And you mentioned you want to tell you want to tell a story with personality. Now a lot of that personality comes from the guests you have on that show. Who are you looking for, and how? And more importantly, how do you book them? <laughs> um, how we book them? I, I, we have some of my colleagues uh, who work as, as as guest bookers and producers. I think are in the newsroom, and uh, if you look them out later, in, or in this room, sorry, be, if you look them out later, they'll be able to fill you in the uh, in on more of the detail of the dark arts of guest booking. Um, but I mean, guest pitches come to us from from all kinds of places, um, whether that is via Twitter, whether it's via email, whether it's to people, you know, people's individual contacts getting in touch with them, or if that's a, to a group email account, you know, all of these things get filtered through. Um, and then, of course, we're going out and working out who we want to speak to as well and pitching for people. And some of the lead times are you know, we want to speak to someone in the next 10 minutes and some of the lead times are booking ahead one or two weeks or even further if it's a big event, you know, something like Davos where we were in, uh, in January, obviously you book you can book a few months ahead, a couple of months at least ahead for that kind of thing. We're at the Geneva Motor Show next week. People have been booking around that for the last few weeks. So there are big set piece events where things are set up ahead of time and then there are other things that happen very much more spontaneously and dependent on the news flow. <laughs> and do people have to get here? Do, do, do they have to physically be in this, uh, this building to be on no. Bloomberg TV? No, they, they absolutely don't. I mean, when we go to events, obviously, we'll send a camera crew and then there'll be a, a camera position there. If you're talking about company you know, chief executives or finance directors who want to speak to us, it's quite common that they might do that from the Stock Exchange if it's here in London or from their own camera, that's possible, or from some other location they happen to be. If they're in other parts of Europe, we've got cameras in all all you know, major cities. So all of those, what we call down the line interviews, are are very possible. I always, I always feel personally, I like to have the person next to me because I feel you get much, you get interaction is much easier. You can have a pro feel like a bit more of a, of a conversation. So my own personal aspiration is always to try and get people in the studio, but that's just not always possible. So yeah. you just you accept that. But if someone was apprehensive about going on live TV, what do you think? Uh, how could someone here sort of? help them overcome that as it were? Um, just remind them I suppose that they are the experts. I mean they've been brought in for a reason to talk about something that we think they they can offer a view on that's interesting and valid and they the ones with, uh, with who are steeped in the content that we're going to be talking about. You know they'll be asked probing questions, challenging questions but they are the ones that they've got the gift of, uh, of all that knowledge at their disposal and that's what we're trying to tap into. So sort of armed with that confidence that that might, might give a nervous guest some, some extra confidence. But the other thing is, I mean, I know lots of TV people will probably say this, but please don't over-prepare. <laughs> please, please don't come into an interview with a list of five questions that you think are going to be asked in that particular order because things can really easily take a different turn. The thing that went before that interview might have, might have changed and therefore a different segue is appropriate and therefore we might end up coming in on what you thought might be question three and you know, if that throws you, that's awkward. So come in with an open mind, come in being prepared to talk around the subject that you're, that you're there to talk about. And how, how much do people need to be involved in the news or are you looking for expert commentators as well? Um, what, what, what do they need to be to... the principals in the news? You need, you want your CEOs or people involved in company news announcements, or, well, or it really takes all sorts. Yeah, I mean we have a really uh, healthy mix of contributors from all of those walks of life. We're interested in hearing from CEOs. We're interested, in, and what's really important to take away as well is that we're interested in hearing about businesses at different different sizes, different. Um, stages of the evolution process. I just launched a, a series on entrepreneurs and we've talked to some really experienced entrepreneurs who've got you know, a number of businesses under their belt. We've also been talking to some real startup entrepreneurs, people that perhaps you wouldn't have naturally thought Bloomberg would make a beeline for, but we're just, we're really interested in telling interesting stories. And if we can attach those businesses to a broader story, to uh, some of the bigger themes that we talk about a lot, for example, we talk about business increasingly going mobile. It's been a theme over recent years, but we've talked to a number of quite small retailers about the opportunities that mobile technology has given them. So it's not all about CEOs of FTSE 100 companies, for example. It's about a much broader range of people, and it is about those expert commentators that you refer to. And then on top of that, there's some esoteric sort of programmes in the schedule as well, and, uh, and not all of the programmes are made out of London. So. Uh, there's one out of the west coast of America which is about tech yes. and uh, how would people in from in the London market get involved in, in something like that? Well I mean the Bloomberg's all 
you know, one big family. So feel, feel free to get in touch. If you've got London companies, European-based companies, and you want them to get onto US programming, then feel free to get in touch with the newsroom here in London or to go direct if you have contacts there. Um, it, the, the, I'm sure they would be interested. Certainly, if you've got technology companies and you want to pitch them to Bloomberg West, I'm, I'm sure if they, you know, they would they would evaluate them just as they would evaluate any any story that was pitched to them from Silicon Valley. You can use you can think of this studio as as available for that as well. So, you know, if you want to, Bloomberg West goes out late at night, our time, or at least late in the afternoon, long past the time I've normally gone to bed anyway. And you you can. Uh, you can come in and use the studio facilities here to do an interview down the line into that kind of program. Now, Anna, you mentioned how social media is changing your world in, in TV. As Stryker, how has it impacted your life as a journalist, uh, and particularly dealing with uh, as a print journalist? Well, I think <clears throat> what we realize is that we have to be, uh, even though we're at very much at the other end of this food chain in some ways, Bloomberg Markets, for example, uh, monthly magazine. The stories we do are two to four or five thousand words. Uh, some of the some of the stories that are going out uh, out of uh, under Mark's jurisdiction are eight words. <laughs> uh, so we're at the other end, but we have to in order to have our stories reach an audience beyond the terminal users. We have to use social media. Uh, we use it to basically attract attention to stories that can be accessed on the web. Uh, stories that run on the terminal, uh, as Mark was saying, certainly the magazine stories will all end up on the website. And, and uh, we use social media in the, way that, uh, in the way that anyone does, really, to attract attention and to, and to promote stories, to foment thinking about our stories. And could you give me a brief overview, please, of um, the stable of print titles that you have here at Bloomberg? Yeah, I mean, you start with, with Bloomberg Markets, which would be our, that's the oldest magazine in the, in the stable. It's, uh, it's a monthly magazine. We run six to eight features every month, uh, as well as shorter articles. Uh, uh, we have our own writers. Uh, and we also use writers uh, and reporters uh, for Bloomberg News. So in some ways, we're like a bit like uh, a hum hummingbird, kind of hovering over all these different uh, sort of different desks that Mark is talking about and, and getting the best stuff. The, the, the really good stories uh, that have legs will ultimately percolate up through the system and probably end up in the magazine. I mean, Mark and I worked on a story quite a long time ago, uh, in, at least in terms of my Bloomberg career, on LIBOR, which uh, we did long before the wave really broke in a, in a big way. And we do that all the time. Uh, our readers are terminal users, so th they are obviously in finance, so most of what we do has to in some way be linked to what their interests are. Uh, they are also, um, among other things, they uh, are generally very, very wealthy. And that means that, uh, that we can bring advertising into the magazine, which helps support what we do as well. Uh, I think the, uh, the average income is something like $400,000 a year, something like that. And in addition, you've got your own luxury brand. Yes, which, well. which is related to, to the wealth, frankly. I mean, we, not many people have started a magazine in the last couple of years. We did. And it's proved really successful. It's called Bloomberg Pursuits. Uh, you'll see it out there uh, if you haven't already. It's, a, it's now quarterly. It's doing really, really well. Uh, it's, it's, it's different than what we do in, in markets in that it's liberated a little bit from the, from the constraints of, of financial journalism and, uh, and the uh, sort of penchant for really, really strict uh, um, 
I don't want to say accuracy because the stories are all accurate in pursuits, but they're they're livelier, they're looser, they're much more they're much more likely to be about uh, lifestyle than we would do in Bloomberg Markets magazine, even though we do some of that as well, and uh, and it's it, some beautiful photography, uh, and we also break news. I mean, the, I think the issue that's been distributed out there today is brand new. It's a it's a it's a story, the first story about the, uh, the, the reconstruction of the United Nations building in New York. It's a, purely an architecture story. And we do it because it, it allows for beautiful photography. Uh, but here is a copy of the latest Bloomberg market. Yes. And you've got Vladimir Putin on the front because behind that is a big investigative piece about um, about Russia, but you all, beyond the investigative work, you also have sort of diarized reports that come in on a regular basis, and uh, like you have your billionaires issue, and yes. you have your hedge fund issue. We have world's strongest banks, we have emerging markets, we have a global poll we're going to be doing in the summertime this year. Yes, we do have sort of regular features, which uh, which afterwards if anybody wants to know what they are I can I can give them the list and they're diarized so they are they, and around those you do a series of articles and we uh, do absolutely there's the billionaires issue which is comes out uh, just before Christmas of course uh, and that that basically features maybe three to five uh, billionaires some of whom uh, you may have never heard of and it's interesting Stryker, you've worked on both sides of the Atlantic, mm. and, and you, but you've had a good chance to have a look at the, uh, the media communities in, 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 in both markets. How would you really distinguish between uh, US financial journalism and financial journalism here in, in the UK? Um, I would distinguish, first of all, uh, separate out the financial part of that question first. And, and I, the journalism is very different. Uh, the, uh, any American journalist who comes over here, and uh, as I did, 1996, uh, you you realize immediately that the newspapers here are a very different animal than the ones in the United States. They're really fun to read, but uh, you also you have to learn how to read newspapers here in a way that in America you could basically go from city to city. Most of the newspapers are dead now, but those newspapers that exist. There, there's going to be a common denominator of objectivity, balance, fairness. Uh, there's, <laughs> we, do, we do in America, we do our screaming and, uh, and proselytizing on radio for the most part. A little bit on cable television, but the radio is, is just amazing. I mean, when I go back, I, I force myself when I'm driving to listen to uh, Rush Limbaugh and all these characters on the radio. Anyway, um, here it's flipped. Here you have the television is really uh, BBC, you know, ITV, very um, real serious news, uh, balanced, straightforward, and the newspapers are the ones that 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 play the role of heckler and megaphone. Uh, there's a lot of uh, there's, there's actually much less reporting, actual reporting in the newspapers here than there would be in a typical American newspaper here. A lot of it is megaphone journalism. It's people basically using reporters, using different newspapers to, to argue with each other. Have you found that uh, these differences are reflected in the communications market at all? If so, uh, do you think there's anything the PRs in London should learn from the US? Well, there are uh, several things. Uh, one is, I think that, uh, first of all, when you're dealing with Bloomberg, you're dealing with an organization that operates very much under American journalistic standards. And therefore, embargo actually means embargo. Off the record means off the record. Deep background means deep background. Background is background. We, we honor those things. Um, I sometimes feel that here that um, people in, in your business uh, putting out stories, you're just terrified that you're going to get killed, uh, that you're going to get 
that the story is going to be turned around. We will look for the right story to tell, but 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 we will, you know, if we've made a, an arrangement about, for example, not doing something on this story before before a certain time, then we will stick to that arrangement. And I think that there's a lack of, I think there's a lack of trust here between uh, people who are marketing the news and people who are writing the news that is the gulf is greater than it is in the United States. Mark, you're an English journalist writing for an, a US organization. Can I cross-reference some of those statements by, um, by Stryker there? Off the record, what does that mean to you? Well, we're, at, we're a global news organization with US standards is, is a yep. different way of thinking about it, maybe. Um, breaking an embargo? you find yourself in a HR situation where you will probably be issued with a formal reprimand. Do it too often and you won't be here anymore. Right, so people, the people embargoes are absolutely sacrosanct here. Yep. And, and the, the other thing is we put our hands up. If we make a mistake, yep. we tell the issuer. We don't wait to be found out. Does that go so far as to actually do pre-briefing? Uh, or, or would you just recommend sort of setting up briefings post the embargo beforehand? Beforehand is always better. Every, everything in the real-time news business, preparation is everything. The more notice we can have about anything, the better we're going to serve the reader and the better the PR community can serve as its clients. Can I give you another example of, of what Mark's talking about? Um, one of the first things that I noticed about Bloomberg, which was long before I came to it, is the lack of anonymous sources. Uh, that was my next uh, one. Here, I mean, anonymous sources, poisonous stuff gets out that way. Uh, in, in really, in most media, uh, I used to work for Newsweek, uh, too many anonymous sources. Here, if you, we do use them occasionally. I mean, just for example, I'm working on a story now that, that talks about <coughs> an IPO that will take place in Asia at a certain time this year. And we quote somebody saying that it's probably going to raise X amount of dollars. And in that case, uh, we say something like a person familiar with the deal. Uh, but in order to say that, we, ha and it's a, in this case, it's a banker, but in order to, s who's involved in the deal. But in order to say that, we have to write a source memo, which then has to be approved by uh, the executive editor, one of the executive editors or higher. So it's very, very strict. And so you can't, uh, you know, somebody can't come up to you, to us as a journalist, whisper something in our ear uh, to take somebody down and then expect it to appear that way, unless they want to be quoted saying it. You publish a story about a company. Does your journalist have to call them up beforehand? Yes. Absolutely. You have any subject of a story has to be given the right of reply. And again, if that didn't happen, that becomes a matter for a disciplinary action. Um, what is the official gr ruling on off the record here? We absolutely believe in off the record. We do lots and lots and lots of off the record briefings every week. We love editorial boards. We want to understand businesses better and people better. Yeah. And the only way you can do that sometimes is to break bread without a tape recorder and without an opera. And We're very happy to do and that. And some of those edit boards will, will go across the, the business as well. Indeed. So I've been in edit boards which have been run by the, you know, the expert from, from print, but then have, some people from TV have been involved as well. So you know, you, if, you, if you take an executive, one of your clients, to an edit board, you know that they, if you set it up that way, if you want that kind of uh, grouping, that you can get exposure to. You can make sure that everybody throughout Bloomberg who needs to know is familiar with your story. Mm -hmm. And you break bread with someone, and you always pick up the tab. Is that right? Always. Because <laughs> 23 years, no one's bought me a cup of coffee. <laughs> and it's, it would, it would again, it would be a disciplinary offence. <laughs> now, if you want to take a reporter to the rugby because you want them to meet some of the executives, then clearly we can't buy our own rugby ticket. What we do instead is every year at the end of the year we make a massive donation to charity. We add up the value of everything we've been to that we couldn't pay for, and we make a donation to charity, which solves our conscience and hopefully. <laughs> keeps our standards. Um, uh, more, going down this sort of PR tips angle a bit more, how would you advise someone to uh, pitch a story to Bloomberg? Have a surprise in there. 
make it compelling. If you speak to a beat reporter and you have something that is new and exciting and is going to move the needle, um, the beat reporter is not going to turn you down on that. Um, if it's a marketing exercise on behalf of your client, we're going to smell that a mile off. Sorry, we just probably will. And that's probably not going to interest us very much. If you have a beleaguered client who has been pilloried in the press by the British media not observing the same standards as we do, we would love to talk to that client. <laughs> and we will write a fair, balanced, interesting story on their behalf. Again, we're not in the business of doing a marketing for them, but we are in the business of, of, of plain song. We don't put spin on our stories. Uh, and one interesting uh, thing that's come out of, of this is, particularly in Westminster, the government and the opposition are very aware that we don't spin stories. We're not the Guardian and we're not the Tory Graph and we're not the Daily Mail. And our access in the past few years has massively increased for that very simple reason. Um, we're going to go to the floor for questions in a moment. But before we do so, uh, Stryker mentioned how um, social media was impacting his world. Uh, but I see. 1835 followers. <laughs> 1836. I still on, don't know why that. that I'm not sure what matters, but. but. <laughs> but they, so, you've got involved in Twitter, but I have. but so tw uh, social media is becoming big in the financial markets. Any good blogs out there? Do you think social media and, and regulated markets works? Hot story yesterday afternoon, about 1:35 in the afternoon, was that David Moyes had been sacked as Manchester United manager, and the New York Stock Exchange had been informed. <laughs> Hands up, everyone who saw that story. It's not true, is it? But according to Twitter and according to the blogging sites, he was gone. And the New York Stock Exchange, where Manchester United shares trade, had been informed. You can't trade on Twitter and blog sites. Now, that said, we now have a special Twitter feed that comes into the Bloomberg to our readers yeah. that distinguishes financial tweets, and we let them make their own decision. If they want to read tweets and they want to think about trading on it, we'll let them make the decision. But you wouldn't. You just wouldn't. <laughs> Not when there's money at stake. Not when you've got skin in the game. It's all very well gossiping about football clubs, but you're not going to sell Manchester United shares based on, or buy, sorry, Manchester United shares, depending on what you think of David Moyes. I wonder who you support, Mark. <clears throat> That'd be Liverpool. <laughs> Um, we have got some microphones uh, floating around, so if you uh, please put up your hand uh, and they will come to you uh, if you've got a question. And I'd be most grateful if you could introduce yourself beforehand. Anyone got a question, please? Ah, one right at the back. Hi, it's uh, Charlie Morrow from Cognito. Um, question for Stryker, really. Um, how do you put together the um, the editorial content for an edition of Markets, um, what's the sort of editorial process behind it in terms of deciding what you're going to cover? I would say that uh, probably 80, 80 to 90 percent of the stories are uh, come from the writers uh, that we have. We have uh, from our staff writers and from people who work uh, for Bloomberg News somewhere in the world, who somebody has a story. Most of them come uh, from there. W to be honest, we don't often, uh, we, a story doesn't often land on our desk that's from a, a, a PR firm, for example, that makes it into the magazine. It has, it has happened. It can happen. Uh, and there's an art to doing that, because if you're if you're if you're selling a story or pushing a story to to one of the journalists on the beats that Mark is talking about, uh, uh, you do it in one way. If you're selling a story to us, it has to uh, it has to have that element of surprise that that Mark's talking about. It but it also has to be a story. There has to be some story behind it. There has to be a narrative, something that will encourage the reader to actually sit there and spend 20 minutes, 40 minutes, maybe an hour actually reading a very long story because, because it's worth it. Uh, 
So most of our stories come in from our writers, from BN reporters. We have uh, once a week we have a we have a meeting where we discuss feature proposals. They're on the terminal. Uh, this this is a global call. There are usually about twenty or thirty people, and we go through maybe five or six stories a week. Most of those stories have have in effect been green lighted beforehand, but. It allows people to come on and sometimes add to the story, sometimes also to maybe knock a story down and say it's not uh, that's not quite right, uh, and that's a weekly process. And we need our reporters, our writers, spend sometimes one or two months working on a story, so we have long lead times. Uh, and if you want, if you if you have a story that you think is going to be a, a really good story in a couple of weeks, you probably come to the wrong place. If you think you have a great story that would work at the end of the year or uh, in the summer, then uh, we're open for business. Anybody else? There's one. Uh, yeah, so question for Anna. Sorry, my name's Alistair from Abchurch Communications. Um, do you cover private companies? Uh, yes, we do. We do. I mean, a lot of the DNA of Bloomberg is about covering companies that are quoted. But when we're talking more thematically about um, about trends in a particular industry, we will often search out a private company or you know any any company that's in that field and see if they'll come in and talk to us about it. Um, I mentioned this entrepreneur series I've been doing recently. On the back of that, we talked to loads and loads of really quite small businesses, but they're all part of bigger trends, whether that's mobile, something to do with technology, something to do with where the luxury industry is going. You know, they, they, as long as they are, they can be quite a small business, but if they tap into some bigger theme that, that we're picking up on generally here at Bloomberg, um, then they've got a, a good chance of, uh, of being heard. And yet, yeah, not being listed should not be a reason to, to not get in touch. Absolutely. There was a great package on craft brewers just this week. Oh, that took your attention to Very, them. <laughs> Again, they don't need to be listed companies. The we were at the Lego. Pitch. We spent the whole morning yeah. at Lego this morning. Yeah. That, yeah. That's, I mean, we went, we recorded, this has been a, a project that's been the, in the works for months, you know, time to go around the film, even though the company licenses the rights to somebody else to make the film but we 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 made trips to the my colleague David Tweed made trips from Berlin to the factory he filmed four packages around the factory we were then there there live uh, via satellite doing an interview with the CEO this is a business that you can't invest in but it you know in, as a retail investor but it's just a fascinating story and those bricks make great television so you know there are all kinds of ways that we punctuate the rest of our coverage with that kind of uh, really visual story. The, the word you'll have heard again and again from all three of us is story. It's all about the story. That's what. That's the game we're in. We're telling stories. We don't have to fill white pages. We don't want to bore those eyeballs. You can't charge someone twenty thousand dollars a year and then bore them. It doesn't work. But is there a general rule of thumb about the size of companies that you you will follow in on the terminal, as it were? Again, if the if it's if it's a small company and it's just saying its results, then I can, do, I can have a, an algorithm read those results and spit those headlines out and do that story. I don't want someone's brain being a typist doing that. That's not efficient. And your press release reprinted on our system is probably going to do most of the work for a smaller company. If that small company's got a fascinating <coughs> story to tell, though, then I do want someone's brain engaged in that, and we do want to put it in context, and we do want to talk about trends and the industry and what it might tell us about the future. Then for, we have a story. And for example, this week we, we talked to one recruitment company that's not enormous, and next week we're talking to another UK recruitment company that's not enormous. But because there's so much attention on the growth that's coming out of the UK economy right now, just how fast unemployment rates are going to come down, if we can talk to people who seem to have some kind of view from the coal face on that, then that's really colourful and that really feeds into a broader picture. You know, it's, it's, it's maybe a bit anecdotal, but when, you, when you're watching television, that's maybe the kind of thing that sticks, is some of that um, anecdotal colour that goes around some of these bigger economy stories. Anybody else, please? Oh. <clears throat> Sunny Tucker of Namira. 
Uh, question for Mark. I mean, last year, globally, Bloomberg had a well-documented spot of bother about uh, relations between the commercial department and editorial department. Uh, what steps have you taken that have strengthened that Chinese wall to make it more robust and visible and credible? There was a report published just today by Dan Doktoroff, which is the findings of um, the investigation that we did into those incidents. Um, and I guess the, the biggest concrete thing that I could tell you about is we appointed a global standards editor, um, Tim Quinson, who's been with the company even longer than I have, 24 years, I think, um, and was my boss previously, um, who ran Europe, is now the global standards editor. Um, he has a team reporting to him around the world um, to make sure that we do a better job of policing that Chinese wall um, and ensuring that there is no scope for even the impression of impropriety about how we deal with these things. Yeah, well, sorry, Mark, just to follow up, why do you think it got to that stage out of interest that there was even that perception? I think that when you are a successful media company that hasn't really had a misstep for two decades, there's an element of some of our competitors don't like us very much. Which is fine. <laughs> OK, thanks. One at the front and one at the back. Um, hi there, um, my name's Jude and I work in the healthcare industry. Um, I know that pharma is a very big um, news, obviously, for business, but is there ever scope on your site for stories that are more patient or just healthcare or treatment related in general, or does there always have to be a business slant to your stories? We did a very big feature on the Crick Institute, which is being built um, near um, Houston State, well, between King's Cross and St Pancras Station. Um, because it was an, an interesting um, social story as much as anything. You're going to have this laboratory that stores very dangerous viruses as part of its research where there's a lot of money being spent and it's going to be one of the biggest in Europe certainly, um, but where the local residents have a lot of concern about the security of those viruses. Um, <coughs> being sat next to the Ebola virus is not something most of us would volunteer to do. And it was a great story. So again, if it's a good story, um, we're going to put some resources into it. We're going to try and tell that tale. Um, drug development's always interesting. Um, and the social aspect of healthcare, if it's about policy within a country, and it tells you something about the backdrop of that country's economy or how it's social policies are developing, we're going to be interested in that as well, if it's a good tale. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be about business. There was nothing about the Crick Institute story that, that related to anything you could buy or sell. But it was a rattling good tale, and we had some really good local voices in it from, from the residents concerned. And, and just to add a, a TV dimension to that, um, one of the big themes coming out of Davos and the conversations we were having there this year was about Technology has disrupted certain industries over the last five years. Airlines, shopping, you know, the list is, is, is fairly long. Where is going to be disrupted next? And two of the industries that were, that were mentioned quite often were healthcare and education. And so we've got that sort of thing on our radar as well, that if we hear of, of companies that are behaving quite disruptively in that, in that field, if they've got something new and it's going to really shake things up, then that's something we'd be interested in. Then our investigative reporting goes in whatever direction uh, the investigations take the reporters, really. So it, it doesn't necessarily end up having something to do with uh, business all the time. Got time for one more. Hi, my name is Christine. I'm from the Institute of Chartered Accountants. It's a question for Anna, really. I know that some broadcasters have got quite clear policies for trying to attract more women to appear on the screen. Do you have any guidelines in that direction, or do you actively seek out women if there is a choice between a man or a woman to come on? I'm not aware of an official policy. I'm looking I to something. I can intervene. I'm, okay. Yeah. So the editor-in-chief, Matt Winkler, does something called Winkler's Weekly Notes. 
every week and it's a list of things we did wrong, things we did well, things we should do better at. The edition that came out yesterday at four, today. was it today? Today. So yeah. this morning, so about five o'clock, five a.m. his time in New York. The first item on it is about voices of women yeah. in all of our platforms and it stresses that uh, we, did a, we did a quick survey and it was below 15% I believe, which is just not good enough. Um, so there is a, a definitive policy, not just television, across all of our platforms and we want to hear from women more. We actually have a, an executive editor just for women's <coughs> coverage um, and we've spearheaded a lot of stories. We did a bunch of profiles of women economists and analysts around the world. Um, it's a problem and yes, we, we, we definitely have a policy to try and address that on all of our platforms in all of the ways we write about news. It was interesting when we first started putting together lists of guests, potential yeah. um, people we'd want to interview for our entrepreneurs series because we were casting the net quite wide and we were going to quite small businesses we would we were for a period of time we were only finding women there just there's such a, a wealth of of female entrepreneurs out there at the moment for whatever reason and uh, so yeah it's certainly on our radar in that sense I'm sorry I'm, I'm gonna draw an end to questions uh, certainly from the floor for now but if you do have questions then please uh, stay behind afterwards. In fact, everyone, please stay behind afterwards. There are refreshments. But there are refreshments, and there are lots of the Bloomberg team out in the hall to meet you. Um, they very, they very cunningly put uh, their Beats name on the little pod where they're congregated around, so it shouldn't be too hard to track down someone relevant to you. But in the meantime, I would like to thank our warm-up act. Um, Mark, Anna, Stryker, thank you very much for your full-blooded <laughs> contribution. Thanks. Thank you.